Hello, everybody, and welcome to Every Secret in Risk of Rain 2. This video is catered towards you newer players, but those of you that have been playing for a while should also stick around because you'll probably learn at least one new thing, if not a few. I'll section this video in two parts, gameplay or environment related secrets and item or player related ones, or just put simply things you can interact with and things that you can active and passive secrets. The information here is going to be as concise as possible. So if you're looking for more details on the topics covered, check out my beginner video playlist in the top right and description below, which covered things like the impacts of choosing a difficulty, when to spawn the boss, when to farm for items, getting lunar coins, and all newt altar locations, and much more. Also, you'll see a silly little Vegas watermark show up in the bottom of the screen occasionally because I'm using the trial of a newer version of my editing software, and there's no way to remove it. Sorry about that. All right, there are timestamps below if you want to skip to a certain topic, and again, consult the beginner video playlist for more details. Let's begin with the most common secret I get asked about, the big door on abandoned aqueducts. How do you open it as a solo player without using the engineer? If you didn't know, this door is opened by two pressure plates that are hidden somewhere in the stage in random locations. They are almost always found behind an object, so look for every gray rock, every tree, and make sure to cross the bridges and search the little island locations for the tan-colored buttons. The door blocks access to the Kiaro and Renald fight, which are two elite Elder Lemurians that will drop their respective bands when killed and completing the Death Do Us Part challenge. There are currently three ways to open the door. Number one, the exploding clay pots on the stage can very rarely spawn on one of the hidden buttons, meaning all you have to do is find the other button and step on it, which will open the door. It's rare enough to not count on, but not too rare that you can't have it happen. Number two, if you don't have insane luck, your next option as a solo player is to roll one of the existing clay pots onto the nearest button, which will then enable you to go and find the other button and open the door. However, this is much easier said than done. I tried on stream for about 20 minutes to roll a single pot on a button and I could not get it done. I'm just a papagi brain though. So in my opinion, the third and easiest way to open the door is to not even bother opening it in the first place. You can easily clip through the top left corner of the door, given you meet one of two requirements. Number one, you have a dash related mobility skill, such as the Huntress's blink or any of Merc's abilities aside from his basic attack. Or two, you have a sizable amount of movement speed, probably around the plus 200% mark while sprinting. If you have either or both of those requirements, you can just stand as seen here, sprint into the door until your screen starts to shake, and then either use your mobility skill or jump, and it should put you right through the door. To exit, simply repeat the process, although it can be a little more tricky to get out. Just keep trying and you'll eventually get it. The next secret are the two environment logs for the hidden realms. The Gold Coast, which is accessible through a gold portal by activating the Shrine of Gold, which is a rare spawn in any stage, and the Realm Between Time, or Lunar Bazaar, which can be reached via the Blue Portal, which also have a random chance to spawn, but we'll cover that later. However, activating a Newt Altar will guarantee the spawn of a Blue Portal upon completion of the Teleporter event, and we'll talk about those altars here in a second. For the two Two hidden realms. Their environment logs are, big surprise, hidden on the stage. The good thing is they're always in the same spot. For the Gold Coast, simply go to the middle of the map and climb up the huge rings. This requires either a Hopu feather or two or some movement speed items on a character with a dash mechanic. Keep climbing and once you reach a point where there are two golden rings connected instead of a gold and a black ring, the environment log will be sitting under the topmost rings area. Sounds kind of confusing, but just rewind and watch the clip to see exactly where it is. The blue portals log is much easier to find. Once you spawn in, simply face the entrance of the bazaar and jump off the ledge. Fall down a bit and make sure you turn around to face the big pillar that you jumped off. Once you see the log, just aim and maneuver onto it and collect it. Having a double jump helps quite a bit here since you can jump to better position yourself if need be. The third secret are the three guaranteed newt altars that spawn on abandoned aqueducts, rally point delta, and scorched acres respectively. Every other newt altar aside from these three spawn at random, so knowing the locations of altars that will always be there is useful in deciding whether you want to act access a blue portal or not. For the desert stage, if you're facing the big door, go to the right and continue along the bend until you see the big skeleton laying across the cliffs above you that have the red banners waving in the wind. Make your way up the hill and to the top of the skeleton and the altar will be sitting right there. It helps that as you run along the bend, stay to the upper side of it so you don't have to worry about jumping, rolling, or dashing up the hill and rather you can just run all the way to the altar. On the snow stage, look to the center of the map and up. See the huge crates that have plowed into the cliffs? That's where you're going. Go up to the lower ledge and wrap around it until you reach a plateau. Then then jump and dash up the hill continuously until you reach the top. Move around to the back side of the containers and there is your altar. This one can be quite tricky to get up to, so I'd recommend waiting until your second loop, so stage seven and beyond, because chances are you'll have more moving speed items and hopu feathers for the ease of traversing these large heights. Finally, on Scorched Acres, again, all you need is a bit of movement speed and maybe an extra jump or two. Look for the island that is totally separate from the playable map and jump across to it. Just walk up until you see the altar and boom. Again, these three altars are guaranteed to be there 100 
100% of the time. And if you're looking for the spawn locations of the other altars, which there are three possible spawns per stage, check out my older tips and tricks video, which shows every single location. The link is in the beginner videos playlist. Remember that accessing these altars requires the use of a lunar coin, which are obtained in two ways, obliteration and random drops. For obliteration, the exact details are in the video I just mentioned, but the gist is to reach stage seven, take the celestial portal after killing the boss, the portal will always be there after your first loot, by the way, and obliterate yourself at the obelisk below. This grants you five coins, but ends your run. So do not do this unless you want to move on to a new run. The other way to obtain coins is by getting them as random drops. The chance of obtaining a coin is 0.5% for any enemy kill. Bosses and elites have the same odds as just regular enemies. However, the important note is that this chance is halved per coin already dropped. So if you just started a run, any enemy you kill has a 0.5% chance to drop a coin. But as soon as your first coin drops, not meaning when you pick it up, the next one has a 0.25% chance. After that coin drops, the next is a 0.125% chance and so on. You can expect anywhere from two to four coins per run, depending on how long the run goes and how lucky you are. But wait, this halving of the odds also applies to blue portal spawns. I'm not exactly sure what the initial spawn rate of a random blue portal is, but it's definitely higher than 0.5%. However, I do know that each blue portal that appears, whether it be through the activation of a newt altar or just random spawn, will half the chance of another random portal appearing. Basically, all it means is that for every lunar coin or blue portal that show up, the chance of getting another random one is much lower. Again, just because you don't collect the coin or actually go through the portal does not mean that the chance is is not cut in half. As long as they appear, the chance will be cut. Finally here with the last active secret, I wanted to cover a couple quick and easy cheeses for boss fights. If you want in-depth info for each boss encounter, you can find it in my monsoon guide in the playlist, but let's talk about the stone titan and the vagrant real quick. As a newer player, you are probably seeing these two bosses as well as the beetle queen the most. So if you're struggling with them, here's an easy way to deal with both. For the vagrant's big explosion, blocking the damage simply requires line of sight to be broken from it. That's it. Meaning any object, no matter how small, so long as it is blocking the line of sight, which is roughly the center of the vagrant, will block the explosion's damage. So the cheese is that the little arches of the teleporter are actually thick enough to block the vagrant's explosion. This may take a few tries to pull off 100% of the time, but once you get the hang of it, no longer will you need to scramble for a large rock or cliff to block it. Just stand by the teleporter and boom, you're safe. The titans are also pretty easy to deal with, but the execution of the method puts you in some danger, so it's not always viable. Specifically for a single titan, all you need to do is stand directly next to it and it will never laser you. So long as you're close enough to tickle toes, the laser beam will never go off, meaning if you run around him in a circle, chances are you'll be quite safe during the fight. However, letting enemies pile up will greatly increase the risk of doing the strat because the tiny area you're fighting in. Also, if there is more than one titan, obviously it can laser you, so be extra careful or just ignore the strat entirely when fighting more than one boss. And if you are knocked away from the titan or jump too far, it can immediately start its laser, so do not stray too far from it. However, if you see the red eye of the titan light up for the laser, just keep running in a circle and you should be able to dodge the beam entirely. It will always be slightly behind you if you keep moving in a circle. All right, moving on here to the passive secrets. Let's start with fall damage. You cannot die to fall damage. You could be taken to one HP, but you will never die. This is very useful to know if you're scared about jumping off the map or going from an insanely high location, you just, you won't die. However, and this brings me to secret number two, sometimes you won't be taken to one HP, but rather to 10% of your health. This is due to a hidden mechanic in the game called one shot protection. It feels like I bring up one shot protection in almost every single video nowadays, and that actually may be true because, well, I still get questions routinely routinely on how this mechanic works. If you want a super in-depth explanation, check out the beginner's guide and that handy dandy playlist I keep mentioning. In short, as long as you are at or above 90% of your combined HP, you cannot die to a single instance of damage. Meaning if you're full HP and take a massive hit, the absolute lowest that hit can bring you is 10% HP due to one-shot protection. This 90% threshold is met with both your regular HP and any shields you have, but it is separate from your barrier. Barrier is an entirely different stat that has its own one-shot shot protection built in, meaning if you are at or above 90% of your barrier and HP simultaneously, you get two instances of one shot protection. This is ridiculously good and means grabbing a topaz brooch or two early on will drastically increase your overall survivability. Remember though, one shot protection only occurs while you are at or above the 90% threshold. As soon as you dip below that amount, one shot protection will not save you. The next secret mechanic I want to cover is proc coefficient. Basically every item and ability in the game has a rating that determines its effectiveness 
when activated or simply proc. For example, Multi's nail gun, his rapid firing M1, has a 0.4 proc coefficient, meaning that something like ATG missiles 10% chance to proc is actually 4% when proc by the nail gun. If that doesn't make a lot of sense, don't worry and just know that an item or ability's proc coefficient is how useful they are, with a 1.0 proc coefficient being the most useful. Now, so what, you may be asking? Well, the importance of this mechanic comes from understanding which items have a proc coefficient. Some items, like tri-tip daggers, can't proc any other items at all, while other items can create massive chains for your various items and effects and white bosses and huge groups of monsters instantly. I'll leave the link to the wiki page which everything in the game that has a proc coefficient for all the details, but just know that pretty much every ability and item have their own individual effectiveness for your other items. Huntress's Reign of Arrows will proc her ukuleles and other on hits one fifth as much as her regular attacks will. Her R has a proc coefficient of 0.2, while her M1 has a proc coefficient of 1.0. Finally, the last secret we'll cover here is the 57 leaf clover. This isn't exactly a secret, but rather something that you absolutely need to understand, and that is that the clover's luck stat makes it the best item in the game. Hands down, no exceptions. With all the talk about proc chains and proc coefficients, clover takes this all to a whole different level. The luck stat simply just rolls any outcome of an effect to be favorable to you. Favorable, meaning that if the effect is positive to you, like the proc of a sticky bomb or a crit, if the sticky bomb does not proc or you do not crit, the clover will just roll those chances again. However, if the effect is negative, like the chance to gain an affliction from spinal tonic, if you do get an affliction, the clover will re-roll the chance in hopes of you not getting an affliction because the effect is favorable. You get one additional roll per clover you have. However, things such as chest spawns, loot from chests, and chant shrines are not affected by the clover, nor are the teddy bears blocked. The reason why clover is so good with proc chains is that the clover rolls for each individual chance. It does not stop at the first item in a chain. So let's say you have a ukulele, an ATG missile launcher, and a sticky bomb. Ukulele has a 25% chance to proc, ATG has a 10%, and sticky has a 5 You fire one shot with Huntress's M1. If you hit the 25% for ukulele, the 10% for the ATG, but not the 5% for the sticky, the clover will re-roll that 5% in hopes of you proccing the sticky bomb as well. If you hit only the ukulele, not only does the clover re-roll for the sticky bomb's chance, but also the ATG's chance. It doesn't stop after rolling one effect per instance. It will continue to roll for any and every chance of something happening. Now, this isn't even the crazy part. The ukulele and ATG also have their own proc coefficient, meaning their hits can proc your other on-hit items and even one another. The rules with proc chains is that the proc of one item cannot proc itself again. So you can't have a ukulele trigger another ukulele hit, but you can have a ukulele proc an ATG. And the clover, our good friend Mr. Clover, will always re-roll the chances of this stuff happening. Again, for a full list of items that are proc coefficients, as well as what exactly the clover can affect, look in the description below. All right, and that pretty much does it with covering every secret in Risk of Rain 2. If you enjoyed this video and want to see me play the game live, you can check out my stream at twitch.tv slash woollygaming. I do my best to answer all questions that come my way, so if you're struggling with anything or want some further clarification, leave a comment below or stop by the stream and ask me in real time. Also, if you'd like notifications when I upload a new video or go live on Twitch, joining our Discord server is the best way to get them. You can just come and hang out with us too and talk about the game or any game really, so consider joining our server. Links to both my Twitch and our server are down below. Thank you for